Okay, I know we like sitting with our friends, but you know, we got to be real and we got to be safe, so we have to sit uh, six feet apart from each other, okay, and maintain that distance as well. We'll be starting shortly. We are in lesson seven, okay, so if you can turn to lesson seven and then just take a look, see what it's like. Okay, we'll be starting shortly, kids. For those who just arrived, we are on lesson seven. So you can, uh, you can turn to lesson seven, get a little preview of some of the questions that will be asked and some of the activities that you have to take part in, okay?
So, hi everyone, great to have you um, with our confirmation program. And um, don't get scared that the confirmation program is going on and on and on. You know, um, it's going to finish um, sooner than you think. And I'm already starting to see that um, it's having a, a good effect. You're learning a lot about your faith and um, you are growing spiritually, which is the whole purpose of the confirmation program. We are hoping to put you in a place where you can say, yes, I know why I'm Catholic. I know what the Catholic faith is about. I know what it means to belong to the church and so on. So today our topic is, where am I going? And it's going to be a little bit scary um, because we're going to be dealing with topics like death. How many persons here are a little scared of death? Could I see hands? A few persons are. How many persons would sleep in a cemetery? <laughs> okay, I'm not so sure. Okay, we want to do a little review. All right, everybody have pen and pencil ready? So, without turning back to lesson six, let's see how well you can answer some of these questions. So let's look up at the, at the video, please, all right? This is a review of lesson six. Why am I Catholic? You remember that? We spoke about the Catholic Church. So here we go. I'm going to be pausing it at certain points. Does everybody know the answer to this? Who was the rock? Answer is Peter. Okay. Next question. Which is not one of the four marks of the Catholic Church? Could you write it down quickly? Which one is not one of the four marks of the Catholic Church? Write it anywhere. If you said Roman, how many got that right? Okay, great. The word Catholic means what? Without turning back. Write your answers quickly. Quickly. Time is coming up. Universal. How many got that right? Good, good. You all are doing well. The teaching authority of the church is called the what? This one is a little difficult. A, B, C, O, D. Just put A, B, C, O, D. Time is winding down. Magisterium. How many got that right? Very good. Last question. The church is something because it follows the teaching Jesus gave to the apostles who passed it on. A, B, C, or D. And the answer is B. How many got that right? Okay. Good going, guys. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, our topic today is a little bit scary. It concerns something called the last things. Do you know what the four last things are in life from a spiritual perspective? Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Those are considered the four last things that we have to deal with. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. They are not pleasant topics because a lot of us wonder what happens um, after we die. And I asked the question, how many persons are afraid of death? And a few of you did put your hand up. Okay, next question. And you're going to put your hand up quickly and put it down because we don't want anything personal revealed. How many persons here have lost someone close to them by death? Could I see hands? Wow. Almost everybody. Okay, thanks guys. You can put your hands down. Almost everyone has lost someone close to them. And um, what was that experience like? 
You know, how did you, how did you feel? Did it bother you? Do you still miss the, the person? Um, you know, what we are trying to say is that death is part of life, okay? Death is part of life. We gotta, we gotta face it, whether we, we like it or not. Someone once said that we have an expiry date stamped on us once you are born. It's not a nice thing to think about, but that's just how it is. Um, but we want to tell you as well that eternal life is also something that's real. After you die, that's not going to be the end. There is something else afterwards to hope for. And we're going to be talking about that as well. Then we're going to be dealing with the topic of purgatory. Purgatory is like a place of purification that you have to go through before you get into heaven because only something that is pure can actually um, get to heaven. And another thing for us to think about, someday all of us have to stand before God in judgment. We are going to be judged for the things that we did that were wrong. Some of the things that you may have said to someone that might have been a little bit hurtful. Certain actions of yours that were not right. We're going to have to, to answer for those things before God. So that is called the last judgment. Okay? So what I want to do today as we begin, and today we are not breaking up into small groups, right? Each, each uh, presenter will come up and do a different part of the program with you. But you're going to get your break, right? Don't worry. We don't want you to get all stressed out. I want to begin by praying for someone who passed in your family. Could be your great-grandmother or an uncle or aunt or maybe even a good friend. And there's a prayer that we, we usually say and that prayer is found on the first page of Lesson 7. So if you're not there yet, just turn to Lesson 7. And there's a prayer there called the Opening Prayer. Alright, this is a prayer that Catholics usually say when someone passes away. Okay? So let's all say that prayer together as we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Okay? Great, guys. So I'm now going to call upon our first presenter. That's going to be Elisha, and she's going to do the dive in with you, okay? And I think basically what we're going to do is we're going to read through this, and then Elisha will talk a little bit about what it's, it's all about, okay? So everyone, turn to your dive in page. I think that's on the very next page. Elisha, you want to use here or over there or which there is all right for you? Okay. So if we're not already, just turn to page 56, and we're going to read The Way of the Bow. Kyoto is Japan's oldest martial art form. Long before the samurai met in fields of battle with their swords, and before ninjas loaded themselves with spikes and stars to scale castle walls, Japanese warriors regarded this eastern form of archery as their weapon of choice. Through the centuries, as the gun replaced the bow and arrow on the battlefield, Kyoto evolved into a high, highly ritualized art form that can be summarized in a single word, focus. From the beginning to the end of the Kyoto ritual, with archer's eyes over never leaving its target, birds fly, children's cries, um, squirrel, squirrels jump in the way, yet his concentration is absolute. Everything from the costume he wears to the way he draws the bow is designed to attain excellence in truth, goodness, and beauty. This emphasis on focus as a means to attain excellence extends not only to martial arts and to all sports, but to life as well. 
The cheering crowds, aching muscles, and trash-talking opponents, any of all these things can cause a person to be distracted. Your attention has to remain on the basket, goal, end zone, or target. If you're not focused there, you'll have no chance of winning the game. Life is a goal. It has an end zone. It has a target, and in life, as in Kyoto, the only way to attain our end goal is to be with God forever in heaven, is to stay focused on our target and to pursue truth, beauty, and goodness, which are glimpses of heaven and of God, here and now. Otherwise, we end up meandering through life from one activity to the next, aiming our hearts at the wrong target after another. And if we live for the wrong things, we might end up losing the game of life itself. So today we're going to talk about what the end goal of life is, how to stay focused on, the healthy way, on its healthy way, and how that end goal impacts us in here and now. So for today, think about what you want to do in your life. What's your life goal and how you're going to attain it as we're going through the videos. Thank you. to our topic um, for today. So we want to dive right in now, and the first thing we're going to do is to be looking at the video, okay? So pay, pay careful attention, and then you have some questions to answer on the, on the first video, all right? I'm going to put the video on. issues of their day were the only thing that really mattered. But you know what? They've all passed on from this world. You know, there's about 7 billion people on earth today, and within 100 years, pretty much every single one of us will have passed on too. Kind of puts life in perspective a little, doesn't it? You know what else puts life in perspective? When you think about the fact that everybody buried is still very much alive, either as an eternal glory or an eternal tragedy. And we'll still be around long after oceans dry up, mountains erode, long after the sun fades out. You know, when you look at life like that, it kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Today, we're going to look at life in light of eternity.
Hey, how are you? My name is Chris Padgett. Welcome to my world. I love watching movies. Ever since I was a little kid. Movies, television, you name it. I was in it. Like, involved heavily. You gotta have a lot of things to make a movie amazing, right? I mean, you gotta have your drink. You gotta have your food, your popcorn. You gotta have your panda pelt. And, uh... Whatever, you know? A lot of things can make it good, but what really makes a movie amazing, right? Is the actual movie. And so you pick a movie that's gonna be awesome, you know? Usually you pick a movie that's not gonna be in black and white, right? Because they talk really fast. Ah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, when I went to movies, we'd go to like Star Wars. Amazing, right? Lightsabers, weird animals and creatures flying around in space. Could take you. And take you somewhere. So you'd have to think about the crazy life or whatever you were going through. My grandma was the same way. She used to watch all these old movies, Cary Grant, these actresses, Judy Garland, you name it. She loved them. And she'd get lost in the story. It was incredible. But you know what's weird? When you watch these old films, no matter how amazingly famous they were, you know what the reality is? They're all dead. And so are you and I one day, huh? We're going to be dead. Like I want them. What kind of a story is our life going to be about? Like, what will people remember us for? for me, I hope it's more than just my amazing tiger shirt, my striking, my good looks, and my ability to eat handfuls of popcorn effortlessly. You see what happens. It's going to be pretty cool. We're all leaving a legacy. We're all like living in a story that will be remembered by somebody. I hope it's a good one. Why is that sympathizing, doesn't it? Get him on the phone. And tell me what. Why, I think he's thinking. These were so popular when I was a kid. Apparently, they're still popular. And who actually licks a sucker like this? This thing is like gigantic. Well, my, my daughter did the other day. We bought this. Um, anyway, you know what I was thinking about death? I mean, what I realized is that most people don't want to think, they don't want to talk about death. Uh, we know it's there, we know it's coming, and so to avoid it, a lot of people entertain themselves. They entertain themselves until they die. Then they don't have to think about it. They don't have to think about their mortality. Some people, uh, they'll try all sorts of different things, they entertain themselves a thousand different ways so that they just don't have to think about that one haunting question, like what happens when I die? And, uh, you know, entertainment is fun. We do it because it's enjoyable, it feels good, it's instant gratification. We don't have to wait for any type of big answer. We can just experience this moment. It feels good. But uh, we live that way our whole life. We're going to miss out on what it means to really live. And uh, anyway, you know, this is going to give you cavities in it. Seems like yesterday to me. Maybe it was yesterday, Hilton. So while a lot of people entertain themselves to death, there's a whole other group of people that are going to look death right in the eye and they're going to defy it. They're going to just say, you know what, I don't care if you're there. I'm going to live life to the full. I mean, look at me now. I'm defying death. I'm eating a wad of fiberglass, a little insulation. Take that. Yeah. Also, right now, I'm defying fashion. My full shirt is actually acting like a half shirt. That's how I roll. A lot of people do that with death, actually. They just stare at me and I don't even care. They're like willing to do whatever it takes to show death that they're not afraid. They'll parachute out of buildings. They'll jump out of planes and float to the ground, which is also called parachuting. They'll go into cannons and have themselves shot out of it. I mean, I don't really think people actually do that. I saw it on the surface, I think, or on television. I believe everything I see on television, which is why you should believe me. The point is, is that death, it's coming. And a lot of people, even though they want to say, I don't even care about you, death, I'll do anything. Extreme sports, I'm not afraid. Guess what happens? They're all going to die. You and I are going to die one day. And you can defy it all you want, but it's still coming for us. And in the end, it's kind of this big question. Uh, should I live differently? Because death is coming. You know, what happens when I do die? Well, what are you going to do? Well, a lot of people will try to entertain themselves to avoid looking at the reality of their mortality, and other people will try to defy it by doing all sorts of extreme things. I think there's a third category, and that's a group of people that are so paralyzed with fear because of death that they just kind of stop living, you know? 
They don't know how to process it. It's just too intense. Some people become recluse, uh, shut-ins, extreme phobias and neurotic tendencies. They just don't know how to, to cope with the reality of death. They're afraid of the smallest germs, uh, the possibility of any type of colds. And so they do everything they can to protect themselves from their mortality. Uh, they're so safe. They're so afraid. They, they don't even know how to live. And um, I think we have to almost kind of take that head on. We've got to be strong almost. And, and how do we counter that kind of fear? It's got to be love. Like that's the kind of thing that we're looking for, something that's that radical. This was an animal. It was alive. And it was coming after me. And I destroyed it. Made it into a pelt. And uh, I think that's what we have to do when it comes to fear. Destroy it and make it into a pelt and put it on my lap. Which is kind of weird. Um, Yes, death is coming, but we don't have to be paralyzed with fear anymore because we have hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. While it's true, through one man's sin, death enters the world. Ah, but through one man's complete gift of self, back to the Father and the love of the Holy Spirit, we are born again. station at 3 p.m. and is traveling at 80 miles per hour. How long? I'm sorry, Chris. You should have prepared that up. choices that I make today are going to affect and impact my tomorrow. I mean, if I don't study for my exam, it's very realistic that I'm going to fail it. But not only do the choices that I make individually affect me individually, they, they impact other people collectively. And if I have a family member that's struggling or is being very selfish, it can impact the whole entire family for the negative. Really, love allows for the freedom of choices. We have the chance every day to be selfish or selfless. And real love allows for us to fall into the hands of God. And truly, justice necessitates judgment. This is a hard concept for us to understand. But think for a second back to that exam. I couldn't just be given an A if I didn't do A work. And the reality is, is that you and I are gonna have to give an account for the things that we have done and have not done. That's called particular judgment. 
And the Catholic Church invites us to think about this on a regular basis. Even a Mass will say, you know, I have sinned. I mean, I confess that I've sinned. Almighty God, my brothers and sisters, things I've done, things I have not done. I mean, we know that. I think it's deep inside of us that there's a way that we ought to live. And we will be judged accordingly. And God gives us all the benefit in the world, all the opportunities, all the graces that we need to be saints, but often we choose to do otherwise. We will be held in to account for that. And that leads us ultimately to the last judgment. I mean, how I live my life in time right now will impact my eternal destination. And while some people might say, well, no big deal, I'll do what I want, I'll just live, you know, some time in purgatory. But nobody goes to purgatory who's not already going to heaven. And my friends, None of us are going to accidentally wake up in heaven one day, and none of us are going to accidentally wake up in hell one day. Ask yourself, where am I headed with the choices that I'm making right now? And know that God's love will necessitate this judgment. I pray you and I make the right choice. Okay, so there we are. Death and judgment. So I'll ask our presenter to come forward to deal with that topic with us. A very scary topic. You looked at the video. We have a couple questions to answer. Okay, so first video we had Chris talk about death and judgment, so we're going to do the watch it questions. So watch it questions on page 47, segment 1. First question, true or false? If it was due to the man's sin that death entered the world, what do you guys think? Can you guys hear me? True or false? Anyone think true? Who puts thinks true, put your hand up. Anybody thinks false, put your hand up. It's actually true. So because of man's sin, the first sin, death entered this world. And because of Jesus, we have salvation through him. So we do not need to fear death anymore. Okay, question number two. What aggressive animal did Chris claim to have killed and turned into a pelt? We have A, a lion, B, a camel, C, a squirrel, and D, panda. Yep, so you could just shout it out, it's fine. Everyone, anyone say A? Hands up for A. Who thinks B? Put your hands up for B. Anyone say C? Hands up for C. And then D, anyone say D? Hands up for D. So it is D, a panda. When he was in the movie theaters, he showed us his panda pelt. He claims that he had killed it because it came at him. Okay, good job. Number three, Chris says that justice necessitates blank. So does justice necessitate A, revenge, B, judgment, C, a trial, or D, anger? Anyone who says A, put your hands up. B, put your hands up. Yep, that's mostly everyone. Good job, B. That's correct. So, justice necessitates judgment. Good job, everybody. So now we're going to do some small group discussions. I encourage everyone to answer or think about these. So first off, we're going to do a quick scenario. If you were going to die tomorrow, what would be the first thing on your to-do list? Does anyone want to share? Personally, for me, I would take care of my finances, make sure that my family is well secured, and make sure they have access to all of that. Would anyone else, what is what someone else would do? 
Any hands? Anyone would do something practical like that, or would you do something more fun? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good one. She said that she'll spend it with her family. That's always a good way to end. Anything else? Anyone has anything on their bucket list that they would like to do? Yeah. Skydiving? Yes, that's always fine. That's a good rush. Anything else? Anyone else have anything similar to like skydiving? No, anyone would binge a movie series? Okay, Franca, could I ask, are you afraid of death? <laughs> and if so, why or why not? How would you answer that? I would say no, I'm not afraid of death. Because I, okay. I grew up in the church. I believe in the teaching of Jesus and everything I've learned. So I am not, I actually would say I'm anxious to die so I can meet Jesus and meet, go to heaven. Okay, you, you could talk to all of them because they, they would want to hear what you, how you respond. So, like I said, I did grow up with the church, so all my teachings around death have been from what I've learned from Jesus, from the Bible, from fathers, from everyone in church. And I see death as more of a next journey, a place where all happiness, all pain has been eradicated, erased. So in that sense, I am not afraid of death. But death still scares me because it does not, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know who I'm going to be leaving behind. So there's a lot of mystery with death. But like I said before, I'm scared of it just simply because I know that Jesus came down from heaven to give us, provide us our salvation. So if I know that I can live in his light and go in his footsteps, that I will one day be able to meet him in heaven and live an everlasting life with him and all my loved ones. All right, great. <laughs> Anyone else have a question for Franca about death and, and judgment? Do you all really believe that everything you do, you have to answer to God for it? Okay, one person is shaking their head. Okay, you think, you think God is going to forgive us? He's a forgiving God. That's quite true. He is. But we have to be careful of our actions and, and so on, right? That um, we don't do anything that displeases God because God is aware. He knows all things. He sees all things. All right? Okay. All right, I think we can move on to another tough topic, which is heaven and hell. Wow, isn't that something? So we're going to look at the video first, and then Jamie is going to come forward to chat with us about heaven and hell. All right, and then after that, I'll give you guys a break. Imagine you were stuck in an elevator for a half an hour. What if it was an hour, three hours, even the whole day? What if you were stuck in that elevator for a week, a year? 
Imagine being stuck with no way out, confined forever, cut off from every good thing and every good person you had ever known. Imagine a life drained of any peace, any joy, any happiness. And the only thing left is an unquenchable thirst that can never be satisfied. A despair so desperate and so deep that this is hell. talks about hell, and we don't like to think about hell, but it's a real, it's a real factor. When we talk about where we're heading, it's either hell or hell. The truth is, it's kind of scary. I mean, this place of complete absence of love. In fact, Mark's gospel will talk about hell like a, really a place where the worm dieth not, this weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says to the Pharisees, how are you to escape being sent to hell? Jesus is talking about hell as if it's someplace real. We should probably consider that, think about it, and try to avoid it. The Catholic Church is going to help us on our journey towards the love of God. And we'll acknowledge that there are times that we make these incredible mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes, they hurt the life of charity in us. We call those sins venial. But when a sin that we've committed, through our knowledge of it being grave matter, and giving complete assent to it, that can kill the life of charity in us. We call that sin mortal. It kills the life of love. The truth is, if we don't ask God for mercy in the times that we are struggling in sin, then all we have left is to depend on our own goodness, our own strength, and my friends, that won't cut it in the end. We need God's mercy. We're always going to be needing God's mercy. And you and I, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to struggle. And God wants us to be with him forever. I mean, the truth is, we don't accidentally end up in heaven and we wouldn't accidentally end up in hell. Our actions have a reaction. Our choices impact not just us, but other people. I think what's beautiful about being Catholic is that we can know. Here's an area that we're struggling in. Here's where we're going outside of the parameters of where we should be. And here's the way to get back into the groove of what it means to love God. The sacraments give us that grace. The confirmation that you receive gives us that grace that you need to be strong in the Lord. So my friends, don't, don't take it lightly. You're on a journey. You're heading somewhere. And I hope that you know that you are made to head into the hands, if you will, of God. Know that you are loved. And know that the things that you do today are going to affect and impact your tomorrow. You are made for something more. Sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light and everything is in its place. I woke up feeling great. Today was made for me. And life is good the way it should, the way it was meant to be. And it's a beautiful day.
heaven. What's it going to be like? I mean, we don't know in a way. It's an incredible mystery. I'll tell you one thing. It's going to be better than you've ever thought or imagined. I am walking, I am walking, and I am the Catechism says that heaven is supreme, definitive happiness. I mean, that's incredible. Mind-blowing, really. In scriptures, there's some great references, like, I have not seen, ear has not heard. What's going to be prepared for those that love God? There's some incredible verses that talk about like, no more tears, no more sorrow. I mean, it's going to be us forever with real love, true love. My friends, that's what you're picked for. That's what's going to be awesome. I want to be there. I hope you do, too. If you were to ask a little kid, what's heaven going to be like? It's probable that they would give you stories of mountains of ice cream, roller skating rinks, amusement parks, you name it. It would be fun. It would be incredible. If you ask a senior adult, what's heaven going to be like? What's possible? It could be the perfect golf game, never missing a shot in pool, their hip not hurting. I mean, no matter what, God knows exactly what it is that our greatest heart's desire is. And what we were made for was to be forever with him in heaven. Heaven. It's going to be incredible, really. We're going to have a resurrected body. For me, that'll be pretty exciting. I'm not going to lie. The truth is, is that we can't fully imagine it, but here's something that we're not ethereal spirits. We're not angels. We're a human person, right? We've got spirit and body. We're not zombies, right? A body without a soul. We are a very unique creation, made in God's image and likeness. So when we see God face to face in heaven, we're going to have this incredible resurrected body that animates our spirit. Now, my spirit's kind of weird, so I have a weird body. It just makes all the sense in the world. It'll probably make all the sense in heaven as well. I tell you what, as a dad, the truth is I love to surprise my kids. We sometimes will go up the road and there's a great ice cream shop, and when they know we're heading there, it is euphoric bliss. I think that God, for all eternity, is going to find new ways to surprise us. It's going to be family, and it's going to be friends. We're going to hang out. We're going to get to hear the story of how God impacted and touched our life. It's worth our effort here in time to struggle and to, and to maybe suffer sometimes and offer those little gifts to Jesus so that for all eternity we can be in that heavenly bliss. I want to be there. I hope you want to be there. And by the grace of God, we get to be with him for all eternity. That's a good deal. So there we are. So Jimmy will share with us, and uh, we have some questions coming up. Okay, first up, just sit up for a while, because I know you've been sitting for a long time. Can I just get you to sit up? And maybe lean forward like this. Because I want to make sure you're as attentive as possible. So sitting up. Okay, lean forward. Usually there's a different um, postures of learning, okay? So this, maybe more relaxed, this, attentive, okay? Anyway, let's take a look at some of the questions. Make sure you're paying attention. Lots to consider here. Lots going on in the video. Um, let's see, what's our first question? Our first question is, true or false? Jesus taught about the reality of hell. Think about it. I'll give you 10 seconds before I get you to put up your hand. Okay? If it is true, if you could please put up your hand, that Jesus does talk about how. Okay? And just to make sure everybody else is awake. If you think it is false, because not everyone put up their hand, if you could please put up your hand, if you think it is false, that Jesus did not talk about hell, or sorry, let Jesus talk about how you think it's false. Put up your hand. Good. The reason why, it's a good question, because you're probably wondering why we're talking about hell. Jesus talks about hell. 
So we talk about hell, okay? Don't worry, Jesus also talks about heaven. Next question, please. Let's see what they got. Yay. Good. Okay, the catechism calls heaven the state of supreme definitive. What is the answer for this one, please? Hold on. I'll, I'll read it first. Just to make a lot of people to think, okay? So the first one. Oh, man, my eyes are weird. What's the first one say? I can't see what it says. <laughs> I went last week. What's it say? Prayer. Oh, Peace, happiness, or rest. So if you are voting for A, if you could please put up your hand. A. Okay, no one. B, please put up your hand. B. Okay, C, you voted for happiness. Okay. Oh, even the teachers are doing the survey. Um, and then D for rest. So it looks like majority of have, have selected C, so let's see if they're right, Father Roger. All right. What's that? They said C. C, happiness. Yeah. Okay, let's see if they're right. Yep. Yay, good. Is there another question? I think there might be another question. Nope, that's about it. No, nope, that's about it. Good. Yeah. So I know we're going to be having breaks soon, but here's what I'm going to get you to do, because I know it's very hard, especially speaking in large groups. Get your pen and pencils ready. By the way, in the last question, they mentioned the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Put up your hand if you've ever seen this book. Please put up your hand if you've ever seen the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It might be in your households in a shelf. It's a big, fat, green book about this size. If you haven't seen a big, fat, green book, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you've always wondered, what is this Catechism of the Catholic Church they're talking about? Maybe go get one, okay, because they keep talking about it. If you want to take a look a bit more at heaven and hell and purgatory, it's a good starting point. And of course, the Bible is a good one too, okay? If you don't have that, maybe you have a smaller paperback version. It is a white book that says the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Again, Please, I do encourage you, take a peek at it. You can even go online and find it. The whole thing is online. Definitely go take a peek at that, okay? But anyway, like I said, because we've been sitting for a while, it's hard to speak in large groups. So I'm actually going to get you to jot down your answer or answers for what I'm about to ask you. We just talked about heaven and hell. And it's very difficult to talk about things that you haven't seen, you haven't been to. So what's beautiful, what's beautiful about Human beings is that we have the ability to use language to create images of what things are like. So for example, you've never met my mother before, have you? Actually, has anyone ever met my mother before? We kind of look the same. Okay. Now, you've never met her. You don't know what she's like. But I can use images to allow you to know what she is like. Some of them are more literal, so she's short. But some of them are more flowery. She is sweet, but stern. She can tell me to do things, even to, at this age, she can tell me to do things. And I might think she's mean, but actually she's doing it because she loves me so much. She loves me like a mama bear, still, to this age. So the reason I'm giving you that example is because now I want you to write down what you can use, what words you can use to describe heaven, okay? Now, some of it might be your own ideas, but believe it or not, some of your ideas come from somewhere else. For some of you, if you've ever heard about heaven before, you've heard about it because of scriptures, okay? You would have heard readings. Maybe some of you, it's from movies. Doesn't matter. Write down, let's see if you could at least write down three or four images that you can use to describe heaven. You might even share some of the ideas they have in the video, okay? So let me give you a little bit of time to do that, and then there's uh, a follow-up question, okay? Try that. Don't worry about being correct or not correct, it's not math class, okay?
And when you have at least three or four, give me a little bit of a signal. You can give me a pull of your ear, you can give me a whoop whoop. Well, maybe not a whoop whoop, but like just give me a little signal. Just so I have an idea that I can move on to the next question. Okay, so three or four. This is the part I encourage. If you are an artist, for many years people have been depicting it in art form, whether it be in music or painting. That might be a good, I know it's not a challenge of the week, you might want to try that, okay? Let's give another 10 seconds, because these are good things to think about. Okay, follow-up question then, okay? The segment was about heaven and hell. So now I have to ask you the same thing. This time, see if you can write down at least three or four words that give us an image of what hell is like. I actually really like the one that they gave in the video. It's hard for us again to understand what it's like if we've never been there but Jesus told us about it. Okay, so let's do that, and you're gonna give me another signal once you have three or four words. Any signal is good. I don't see a signal. Okay. Thank you. Father Roger, is it okay if I just ask him two more questions? Okay. Actually, it's really three, but uh, one of them is really easy. I'm going to get you to hold up your fingers, okay? You have two choices. Where would you rather go? Put up um, one finger, and, and just make sure it's the proper finger, not the swearing finger, okay, not the middle finger. Okay, put up one finger if you want to go on the path to heaven, and then two, and, and do it in all honesty, don't be funny, okay? This is like an honest question, honest answers. Two, if you'd rather be on the road to hell. So if I could just get you to hold up your finger like this, if you would rather go to heaven, or uh, on the road to heaven, or on the road to hell. Okay, hold on. Some people haven't chosen. I can't see your finger. Maybe you want to go into the next part, which is our next topic afterwards, which isn't too bad. At least on the road to heaven. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Again, journaling again. Okay. What are... Maybe three. We'll go three this time. It takes a while to write things down. What are at least three things you're choosing? Okay, the video keeps talking about you choosing to do things. Not that heaven and hell are going to be given to you. You're, cho you're choosing. Okay? What are about three things you are choosing to do today that are helping you on your journey to heaven. And if you remember what the video says, that merely means eternal life with God. What are three things you are choosing to do today that are helping you on your journey to eternal life with God, to supreme, definitive happiness? If you could please write down those three things. If you find it's difficult, don't worry. Maybe it means that you do things already and you don't even know you're doing it. So as an example, I know it's small, but you, if you have chosen because your parents 
or your guardian or guardians have worked so hard that day and you can see that they're really tired and without them asking you to do it, you decide to, I don't know, at least do the preparation for dinner. Or you decide to get their coat when they come in. You've chosen to do that. That would be a nice example. So it's a small example. But Mother Teresa says, you know, the little things really count. Okay? That's not a direct quotation, by the way. I'm not good at direct quotations. And of course, give me a little signal if you have something there. Oh, good. I'm, I'm happy that people are like signaling me really quickly. Maybe you're really attuned with your actions. That is good. Okay. And then the final question. Okay, Father Roger, and then we can have the break. Is there anything that you're choosing to do that you know is not a good choice. You know it is not a good thing to do. And this time I'll only get you to write one. But these are things you want to think about. And I even, uh, it's funny, they have challenges of the week. I like to give extra challenges for the people who are in my class. I would challenge you to think about that every evening before you go to bed, hopefully before your prayers. Is there something that you chose to do on a particular day that you knew for sure wasn't a good choice? And you're hoping by the mercy of God, God may forgive you. Okay. What's good news about, I don't know if you um, paid attention, but the good news is God's mercy is there. We just have to ask for it. But it's good to know actions you have chosen to do that you know aren't good. Okay, so at least one, and no one's going to read your book, I'm not reading your book. But it's good to be honest about it. Okay. I got you. I got you. And don't worry, you're not alone. We all make mistakes, and we're all seeking God's mercy. Okay? Anyway, God be with you. Um, Father Roger, are we going to take that break? Yeah. Okay. Okay, some pretty serious topics today, and I know you're a little mentally tired, so let's take a break, kids. All right? Um, we kind of don't want you congregating, but you, you can go on your cell phone. You can pretty much go to the washroom if you care to. All right, so 10 minutes, all right, and then we'll resume. We have another nice topic coming up, and that is purgatory.
Okay, so there we go. We have one more video to look at and then um, Aflin will come forward and do the wrap up with us. There are lots of interesting things to talk about and discuss. Uh, the questions for this video would be on page 57, okay? You have two questions. And so we're going to deal with this topic of purgatory, which is a very Catholic topic, you know? Other churches, you may not hear about, about this purgatory stuff. So, let's see. Oh, hey. You caught me doing something manly. I'm not surprised. The truth is, if you're gonna have a successful winter, one where you keep warm, you have to be prepared. You gotta cut wood, you gotta have it stacked up in the storehouse. It's a long winter. And if you don't prepare yourself, you're gonna get cold. There are consequences to the lack of action. The truth is, is that life is kinda like this. If you don't prepare yourself, you can reap the consequences in a negative way. And in fact, as we've talked about before, sin has a lot to do with where we end up. You don't accidentally become a saint and you don't accidentally end up in hell or heaven. It's all part of the choices. Let me show you what I'm talking about. What I have done and what I have failed to do. Now, as Catholics, we recognize that those sins, they matter. That they're important. They have an impact. In a lot of ways, it's, it's like a nail being, being nailed into a piece of wood, right? The nail is secure. I mean, it's steady. It's not going anywhere, really. Something drastic has to happen for it to be removed. And that's really the truth of what Christ did for us at Calvary. Really, because of that self effort work, we could say that the nails, that the sins, they're removed. I mean, really, in a lot of ways, the nails that went to his hands and his feet, that shedding of the blood that forgave our sins, and that, that's, that's necessary for us, right? Because we can't take that out by ourselves. We need Christ to do that for us. But our sin, it doesn't just affect us individually. It affects other people. There are residual effects to that sin. It's like the hole that remains. Look, there's, there's scars in the wood. There's holes. They need to be filled. I can't do that by myself either. That's why we have purgatory, really. Because purgatory is the fiery love of God that's gonna help us to be prepared to see God face to face. I mean, that's what it's about, to be embraced by the love of God. And purgatory is the merciful love of God, filling in all of the holes and impacting the people around us that have been affected because of our selfishness and our sins. And it's not gonna be easy, really, because pain and sin hurts. But thank God for purgatory. On a personal note, purgatory was a difficult teaching of the Catholic Church for me to understand and to embrace. I kind of embrace this weird idea that it was some sort of an add-on. But that's not it at all. And in fact, this was pretty liberating to me to realize that Christ's work at Calvary included the gift of purgatory to people like you. I mean, it's not an add-on. It's part of what it means for us to be on our way to heaven. Thank God for it. Because the truth is, a soul, when we pass, we want to be purified and cleansed. We want to be whole so that when we come and see him face to face, there'll be nothing left of that old. Thank God for purgatory, yes. You know what's amazing, though, is that you and I, we get the chance, living here right now, to offer up our struggles and our sufferings as a gift to Jesus. And that suffering as a gift to Jesus can become redemptive and assist others who are on their journey out of purgatory and into the beatific vision. One time when I was at confession, a priest said to me, I want you to pray one Hail Mary for the soul that just needed one more Hail Mary to enter into the beatific vision. It was such a rush as I prayed that Hail Mary because of the sins that I committed. I knew that my gift, offering it to Jesus through that penance of mine, it was going to have an impact on a soul that would forever be grateful because of my willingness to pray for them. 
I pray that you will take advantage of your opportunity to impact the souls in purgatory. Because really, it's a family. We're part of the family. We're part of a body. And your choice today will not just impact you, but others. That's something to be excited about. What do you know? Some sun. That's kind of cool. Well, without further ado, I got to go prepare for a winter. Seems to be just around the corner. Okay, so there we have it, purgatory as a place of preparation for something in the future. All right, so we'll ask Rita to come forward and you've got a couple questions to answer. Yeah, you got to turn it on from the top. I think there's a little switch there. Okay, I think it's better. Yeah, it's a topic that um, even for me, like Chris said, he found it difficult to embrace and to understand. And how did you guys find it? Does it seem like something that is easy, like hell and heaven? No? Okay. We're just going to go through the true or false questions first, then we can now talk about some other questions around purgatory. Uh, the first question says, purgatory is a state for those who need to be purified before they enter heaven. Is that a true or false? You can shout it out. I'm going to go by the Any hands? How many say true? Show your hands. Okay. All right. False. Did you say true or false? Okay, I think they said true. It's true. So there you go. All right. Next one. Then the next one. Remember, Chris was saying something about what the father told him. So the question is, what was the penance that a priest gave Chris? Can anyone remember? The priest told him to say something, a prayer. Yes. Did you say Hail Mary? Yes. He told him to say one Hail Mary. That was the pen I was given to Chris. So, you know, we talked about uh, it's a state of purification. So, does anybody think they understand that? Because it's a place you go before you go to heaven. So a place where you're playing. I remember some time ago when I was trying to understand this place called the purgatory. It was saying about, and I remember Chris said that, that you know what? It's the merciful love of God. So God loves us so much that he doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants us to make it to heaven. But he keeps talking about the choices we make. The choices we make. So... And I remember in all the videos he talked about, you don't accidentally make it to heaven or hell. It's the choices you make that determines where you end up. But God doesn't want us to go to hell. So sometimes we just find ourselves, make some mistakes, you know, it happens. So that's why God, because he said in the video that, um, you know, God, to see God, we want to be whole without any blemish. You have to go clean. So then, this is a place where you're purified of those little mistakes you make before you make it to heaven. So I'm gonna go over some of the questions, maybe one or two of them. We, we actually have to, let's see how far we can go. It says, how is purgatory a sign of God's mercy? It's a sign of God's mercy, it said love and mercy. The merciful love of God. How is it a sign of God's mercy? 
This is a God who doesn't want us to just go to hell. So the teaching of the church tells us that there's this place where God wants you to be cleansed, purified. You think that is a good sign? It's a good thing God has done for us? Yes. It shows that God loves us so much. So that's why we have that provision where we're purified. Okay, I'll go to the next one now. How does believing in heaven make a difference in how you live your life here and now? Do we all believe there's heaven? Is there heaven? Is there hell? So we believe there's heaven and there's hell. So how does your believing in heaven or hell um, make a difference in how you live your life? Yes. Thank you very much. She said it may make you turn away from some decisions. So it still boils down to your choices. So if you believe there's a heaven and there's a hell, it helps you to choose. You know, then you have to make choices. Am I going to live this way or live this way? So because we believe there's heaven and believe there's hell, I'm sure we don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. So that helps me to think about the things that I do or the things that I don't do. Like you said, it's not an accident that you find yourself in heaven or in hell. So my question to you today, I'm not asking you to tell me, what choices are you going to make? What life changes are you going to make so that you can make it to heaven? I don't want anyone to go to hell because I don't want to go to hell. And God does not want us to go to hell. That's why we keep hearing about the choices we make so that we don't accidentally find ourselves where we don't want to be. So I want you to go with this. What are those lifestyle changes that you're going to make from today? I haven't heard, I haven't seen all these videos, heard all the talks. What are those things you're going to do differently so that you can make it to heaven? Think about them. And um, I believe that is going to help us to make better choices. God bless you. Okay, thank you, Rita. Rita, would you say that purgatory is like God giving us a second chance? Okay, you agree with that. All right, kids, so we have our final topic, which will be like a wrap-up. Um, Aflin will sort of bring things together, tell you about your homework, and um, make a few comments as well, and then you are all finished for the day. So just want to tell those who are looking at the live stream, Remember, you are supposed to take a photograph of your answers in your book and send them to the email that was sent to you. Okay, so Aflin will now do a little wrap-up with us, a little review, and ask you to pay attention to certain things, okay? Okay, so you guys see the Touch Your Heart article? Um, rather than reading it, let's, I'm just going to summarize it for you because I think it's a great story. Um, so Chris basically has a collapsed aortic valve, which is part of his heart that he needs to pump blood, right? And so he goes to the hospital, and then he realizes he needs emergency surgery. And so the exact thing that he says was, I have put my whole life in your hands, Jesus. I trust in you, and I trust that you'll take care of my family. <clears throat> so basically, he says, Jesus, take the wheel, right? He's giving his full trust and putting his full trust into Jesus and God because he knows that in difficult situations, God and Jesus will take care of him. Um, and then continuing into the story, he's telling us that we should live our lives with no regrets, okay? Um, we should always try to follow our dreams. We should do things that we want to do in our life because life is short. Um, so today we talked about heaven, hell, and purgatory. But I really want to um, end this note by telling you guys that because life is so short, you should live your lives as you want to live it, right? You should live it without regrets. You should follow your dreams. I know lots of you have many career options that you want to go into. Think about them and do what you want to do, right? Because you only get one life right now, and you should live it to the fullest. 
So you should really appreciate your time here and you should live without any regrets. Um, we're also all children of God, so God wants what's best for us. So by taking risks, believing in Him, trusting in Him, we're able to live our lives the best as we can. Great. Okay, we're going to move on to challenge of the week. There's three main challenges, so if you guys could just cross off one of the boxes for the ones you want to do. Um, your options are to copy a prayer and say one about purgatory, um, go to con confession, which is a great thing to do, um, and then just say it. Like, is there someone who needs an apology or forgiveness? Um, what are you waiting for? Talk to them or write a letter if that would be easier, and then write your experience in the space below. Um, yeah, I know we usually get to talk about challenges from last week, but because we're short on time, I don't think we can do that today. Um, so let's just end with a closing prayer, and then we'll talk about your whole week. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, we sin and we know it. We'd like to pretend it doesn't matter and that we're not hurting anyone. But in this lesson, we have learned that we damage our own souls and often the souls of others when we turn away from you. Give us the grace to live each day with our eyes on heaven. Give us, help us to recognize and repent of any habits or attitudes that keep us from loving you with all our hearts. Amen. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So for next week, um, we have the Taking It Home articles. Um, it's a great read. I really encourage all of you to read it, have a look at it. Um, it would be great if you could all just write like one sentence about what you read, um, just so that when you're looking back into the book, you have like a mini summary. Um, yeah, and Father really wants us to recommend that you read the section called What About Purgatory? And so what should I say when my Protestant friend asks if I'm safe? Because it's a really good section. Yeah, so thank you for coming to today's confirmation class. Okay, thank you kids, it was great having you. And don't forget your homework, don't forget your challenge of the week. See you in two weeks time, take care. And stay safe please. Yeah.